Hi, my name's Farida, um, and I wanted to start really with a question. And my question to you is, when was the last time you actually decided to take a health check on your relationships and question whether you're being treated with kindness and respect? That's something that it took me a long time to arrive at. Um, so I was actually just 22 um, and not long out of university when I got married. Um, it was an arranged marriage. Um, it was something that my parents um, were keen on. And my understanding about marriage was that um, it was a partnership between two people and it was about two people working towards something good and bringing out the best in each other and helping each other to develop and grow as people. Uh, I invited my husband here uh, from Pakistan and so as such I was his sponsor. I did everything that I thought um, was right to do in terms of supporting him and to be fair uh, my parents always encouraged that as well um, and so they approached it from the point of view that I should definitely add him onto the bank accounts I had at the time, which I did. Uh, I helped him uh, to actually secure employment when he was first here and in the beginning that was um, a lot of um, very kind of basic roles and, and sort of unskilled labour and eventually I was able to support him into other things and helped him in terms of upskilling, um, learning English to a higher level, uh, actually attended computer uh, literacy courses with him as well. So, um, and, and gave him the opportunity to sort of practice in that safe space in the home as well. And that is a real commitment um, from a woman, but the story kind of develops even further. Because actually, in the beginning, I didn't really realise uh, many of the things that he was displaying in his behaviour, in his comments to me, uh, in his, you know, very subtle put downs, in the sorts of things that he was saying to me and the way that he was responding to the things that I would do or say. And so I always explained those away as being that was just his behaviour or that, and then, you know, I did actually respond to some of it in terms of saying, you know, this isn't right or I don't think that that's fair to kind of say that. So I had the opportunity to really kind of be quite vocal and forthright. And I guess some of that was from my kind of uh, personality and my, my, my outlook as a bit of a rebel, really, in the way that I think and the way that I approach things. But I also felt like I had a huge uh, responsibility as, as a person, as a woman um, in my culture. Um, my heritage is from Pakistan and the culture itself uh, very much put the onus on women to be the homemakers, um, the ones that kind of plastered over the cracks the ones that gave you know, that uh, view of happy families. Um, and so it felt like that's what I needed to do. And often I think women uh, in many societies, not just the one that I come from, do actually feel the burden of that. And, and it's a huge responsibility. But actually, you know, to what detriment? And, and actually, what are you facing yourself? What are the thoughts and emotions that are going through your mind? Uh, what are you facing on a daily basis? And, and do you actually acknowledge that this is fair? So as time went on, those put downs kind of continued. And again, there was a lot that I kind of explained away. Um, and I'm sure that I gave him lots of chances, probably too many. Um, and this is why often goodness can be seen as a weakness, because often people can take advantage of it. So as time went on, you know, I saw the way that he would sort of challenge me in terms of listening to my mother, for example, if she'd asked me to do something. And, you know, in contrast, he would want to see if I would listen to him or my mother. So he put me in a position where I felt like I needed to choose. Uh, and these were, you know, the sorts of daily occurrences that started to happen. Um, and then eventually I was able to help him into better employment and then eventually he w went on to a permanent employment working at night. And, and that had its own challenges in terms of um, it being used as a, uh, you know, another kind of punch bag in terms of um, these are the things that I'm going through and I'm going through these things uh, because I'm working at night and, and that's how it's affecting me and everybody else should put up with this. Um, and eventually then when children came along the challenges got bigger and actually, you know, it meant looking at those caring responsibilities, but, 
you know, it was almost like the demands on me were that I needed to, you know, be the homemaker, be the great wife, be the great mother, uh, do all of those things and actually take on all of the burden of that on my own. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, he was the sort of person that liked to pick a fight over very silly things, um, always had things to complain about. Um, nothing was ever really good enough. Um, so that kind of slowly starts to edge away at your self-esteem and your self-confidence. Um, but despite all of that, um, even in the workplace, I had my own challenges in terms of um, just being seen, being heard, and for my efforts to be seen as having the same uh, level of credibility as some of my counterparts. So, and also, this was a time when, in terms of mental health, uh, things like um, this type of domestic abuse were never, not really realised, weren't given, given a name, uh, were not identified as being something that people experienced, um, so not really validated in any way, shape or form. So, in the workplace, um, even the, the understanding of your well-being, your mental well-being, was a complete misnomer, was not a topic of discussion. And so I was meant to go into the workplace and just be this person that um, was not experiencing anything in the rest of my life and, and almost like being a complete different person in the workplace. Uh, but of course, we know that mental health is just the same as physical health in the sense that it has overreaching, overarching qualities, overarching impacts on all parts of our life and that we are one person and that whole person is what we take into all of the situations that we're in. So uh, even though I was facing all of these challenges and you know, was a mother, was a wife, was a carer, was you know, all, all of those things, uh, I struggled um, and, and strived still with the challenges that I faced in the workplace and still went for the promotions, challenged the boundaries, um, always kind of was this warrior, I suppose. Um, and much later in life, looked at the fact that actually um, one of the things that was a real eye-opener for me was watching Doctor Strange. So just that concept of this superpower that he had when he would put on the cloak um, and actually being able to, to master that and, and to grasp it and to really know how to use it was, was really, um, a, you know, really amazing to see because actually that's really what we all have. We all have that superpower uh, and we all have the ability to look inside ourselves and see our strengths and see where we can excel and see where we can make a difference and make an improvement. Um, and, you know, often in these sorts of situations, being really vulnerable is really hard because we often go through life, go through situations where we fear uh, the, the, the fact that we are being judged or that we will be judged by those people who hear our story or listen to our experiences. But the important thing to recognise in this is that to, ha to be vulnerable takes courage and to have courage is to be strong. And so I went through these situations and continually faced these pushbacks, um, these challenges and, and almost the requirement to be a superwoman, which I wasn't, um, not by any measure. Um, but, and, and there were many situations when I would see the whole kind of, I started to see the cycle of behaviour, you know, of having an argument um, because of, you know, some issue that he had picked upon. Um, and then him being apologetic, but then also kind of saying that he was sorry, but not sorry, uh, and justifying his behaviour. And I didn't really identify this as a personality trait. I thought that this was just how he was and he needed to um, have support and help to actually get through it and, and improve as a person. So I gave him lots of chances. I uh, encouraged him to go um, on anger management classes, um, got him books to read. Um, he, you know, again, those things would only last for a day or so, and then he would be back to his normal self. And, you know, within a few weeks, the cycle of behavior would start again. And I did actually manage to get him to go to one anger management class. And much later on, he shared with me that he went along and explained that um, he was losing his temper because of things that um, I was doing or the children were doing. 
so that was uh, really the explanation of the the scenario for him was about deflecting everything that was happening inside of him or what he had experienced in life to actually explaining that that was the fault of others in his situation. Um, and about 15 years ago, just over 15 years ago, um, when I had my youngest daughter, I nearly didn't make it. Uh, I was the thin blue line on the monitor. And fortunately, before I kind of got to that stage, one of the consultants that I was seeing discovered that um, there would be you know, some preparation that he needed to do for this situation in case the worst happened. And um, I was resuscitated three times and then I came back. Um, and that was after being given 36 pints of blood and two of the most expensive injections on the NHS uh, which are, and, and, and being seen by a consultant who only goes out to see cancer patients. And uh, I don't know, I still don't know how many people across the world that were praying for me. And it took a long time to get over, but that was a real line in the sand for me. Because I thought to myself, I've got a creator who's brought me back to this life. And there's a damn good reason he's done that. And I did have some support from family, which, you know, was great. Um, but, you know, the situation still continued in terms of my relationship with my husband. And there were several occasions when I said to him that I wanted a divorce. And he was always the person that didn't want that. And eventually he even got to the stage where he said to me, what if I don't divorce you? What are you going to do then? So his approach was that I need to change myself in order to f conform to the idea that he had for me. I couldn't do that because that wasn't me. And I could see that with the children, the way he treated them, um, you know, ex telling them off excessively um, based on whatever it was, not really nurturing a relationship with them, not spending time with them. I could see that for them, the writing was on the wall. Uh, and eventually, uh, you know, we may look back at the decisions that we make in our lives and think, I wish I'd done that sooner. So in 2018, I finally did develop the courage uh, and the stamina to let him know that this was it, that I wanted a divorce and this was final. And his first response to me was, well, you're not going to get this house. So that is the description of what was important to him in that relationship and it was clear as day. And I guess really what I needed was for my children to be old enough and to be my initial support network to ensure that I could make that decision. And what was even harder was actually sticking to it because what you find is you, because you've got so many conditioned behaviors of being in that relationship, you find yourself thinking, maybe I should just give up, maybe I should just go back to what it was, because I had a lot of backlash from friends, from many people, many members of my family, um, and it was almost like it was just easier to just go back to wh what I had. And actually, then I took a step back and I thought, hang on a moment, why am I thinking like this? And that's where I had to account my own thoughts and my emotions as well. And so sticking to the decision was even harder than making the decision itself. But I think the one thing that has kind of set me in good stead is just the fact that I have a total rebel personality and I won't accept um, second best, frankly. And I think the more that uh, I have become grounded in knowing my true power, that's where I have really been able to stick to what I decided to do.
and actually even the and, and it's quite crazy because he'd put in an application to engage with the children to be able to see the children and it only affected the younger two but um, actually later on it only affected the youngest because um, my my son who was kind of 17 at the time is now 19 and um, so my youngest 15 year old was the only one it affected and the thing is that in society it takes so much effort so much time so much heartache to really be able to prove that you have been abused and it took a Kafkas report in order for the court to recognize uh, that my child had been abused and that the best place for her in terms of um, her safety, her security, her mental health um, and her well-being was to stay with me, which I'm really pleased to say that a couple of weeks ago that is something that they had granted. So um, I'd really like to give everyone the message that domestic abuse is real. It happens. Um, there are many women, there are many men and children who experience it. And uh, in 2022, we really need to be a society of people um, and exist in cultures, whether that's in the home, in society or in work, that recognise what domestic abuse is, um, give people the opportunity to talk about it in a safe space and actually equip people to tackle it in the way that they need to. Thank you.